Ladies and gentlemen, thanks for coming. I know you all have busy schedule. Dr. Grayson should only be a couple more seconds. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming. As you know, I'm Dr. Grayson, and I appreciate you taking time away from the International Energy Summit in order to make it here. What we found has going to change everything. It is, it is the greatest discovery in, that we as mankind have ever found. Dr. Grayson, while well, we appreciate the enthusiasm, please get to the point. You're right. <laughs> as, we talked last, as we talked last time, the geothermal satellites that we've been using are working. We've pinpointed the abnormal energy source underneath Teotihuacan in Mexico. That energy source is exactly what we thought, a complete replacement for coal and oil, a renewable energy source we can use. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. What the satellites found was that underneath the, the, underneath the temple itself is a whole city that was constructed, people living underground. This is a huge anthropological and archaeological discovery. This changes the way we think about ancient people. Ruins buried by an earthquake or some other disaster? No, no, that's, that's exactly it. What the satellites have proven is that this city was built underground purposely. Arthur, can you go to slide number nine? What you see here are clearly supports that are holding up these massive caverns. We're not talking about a city that's caves underground. We're talking about buildings and, and streets and, and uh, marketplaces. These here are aqueducts that are bringing water into this underground city. And we believe that this is sewage uh, coming out of the city. People meant to, were meant to live here, to thrive and underground. The energy source? And the energy source. The energy source is underneath the city. But here's where it gets interesting, is that our satellites are able to view 30,000 feet into the Earth's crust. Underneath the city, we can only view 10,000 feet. And that Dr. Grayson, while this is all interesting, I'm wondering why you called us here to talk about buried cities and malfunctioning satellites. Ladies and gentlemen, you're missing my point. There is no malfunction. What we're talking about is a structure that was built 2,000 years ago that is built from a material that doesn't exist as emanating an energy source we have never seen before. We're talking about a discovery that changes the way we think about science. You're absolutely sure about this. Yes, yes. We've, we've, we've done all the tests that we possibly can. We've, while we've kept this a discovery to try to keep the media out of it, um, we certainly have been doing everything we can to, to prove it. What we're talking about here is the first real proof that there is life in the universe besides us. And moreover, whoever they are, or whatever they are, they have been to this planet. And our next step? We've already tried to make visual contact with the structure itself. Four days ago, we sent in a team to go um, and find this, led by Dr. Joshua Reynolds. He's been leading the expedition site, and he's been a good friend of mine for years. I haven't told him the true nature of the expedition, because we felt like it was better that we keep this as quiet as possible for right now. About six hours into the expedition, we lost contact with them. And all we had were, all we recovered these pictures. That was until yesterday. Yesterday at noon, we received a small, broken message from Dr. Reynolds. Arthur, can you tell that message? <laughs> Amazing. Good God, whole civilization, the hieroglyphics of God of the world. Found a gateway. I can't go back. I'm going to do. What we believe is that Dr. Reynolds' understanding of ancient civilizations has helped him to survive in this underground city. And we believe that he found the alien structure and went inside. What we want to do is send another team in, this time one that's prepared for anything. With Dr. Reynolds missing, is there anyone else we can send? <clears throat> Actually, as, as luck would have it, his son, Chris Reynolds, has recently joined the dig site. And I've known Chris since he was a young boy. He has this uncanny understanding of ancient civilizations. We believe that he could make it in there, find his father, and get to that energy source. Quite frankly, I'm having a hell of a time keeping it out of the city as it is right now. We believe this is our best chance. What if they decide they've had enough playing Indiana Jones once they find Dr. Reynolds? I've known the Reynolds, and I believe that if we need to tell them the true nature of what's going on, their curiosity is going to get the best of them, and they're going to go. Get to Dr. Reynolds, but more importantly, get to that energy source. That technology needs to be in our hands before anyone else gets wind of it. We're on it, absolutely. Now we've kind of uh, given away to the setup of the game, we'll go ahead and start talking about what's next to the game. 
as uh, he mentioned, Chris is going to be the character that's leading the second expedition team into the excavation site. He's also going to be the character the players are going to control for the majority of the adventure. So when we, come, when we came up with the, the concept behind this character, we didn't want to go with the typical action adventure hero that you see in a lot of uh, Um, we didn't want to go with the, with the standard uh, archetype that you see. We wanted them to be kind of relatable. He's probably someone that you would see sitting in his room. He's someone that makes the same decisions in his everyday life that you do. And it's important that we establish this for players early on because the decisions that the players are going to be making throughout the game are going to be important. And this was concept art that we had. This is an idea of what the character could look like. We mentioned that, uh, Tim mentioned that Teotihuacan was the setting for the game. It is a real place. It is a real place that has a lot of fiction and its own mythology associated with it. And we thought that by picking this area here, we could kind of expand upon that. So what you see here are images behind us of how like this Aztec influence could be, sorry about that, uh, that this Aztec influence is going to be built into the city underground. So we have a real world location in the actual uh, Teotihuacan, and it translates into the city of gods or the place where men become gods. So there's a lot of setup there. But a lot of what we can work with is we can either model that real environment or we can take the inspirations and kind of go to our own uh, devices with it. So when you think of Aztec culture, you tend to think of things like uh, traps. You've got spikes, you've got darts, you've got uh, rolling boulders and swinging, you know, swinging logs and stuff. And there's a lot of things that we can do with that, taking the real world inspiration and building our own creative uh, area down there. He mentioned that there's going to be this transition from this uh, underground Aztec city to something that's a little bit more foreign and alien or unidentified as we mentioned earlier. And this is kind of the area of the game where it's it's undefined right now. It's it's something that is uh, it's obviously underground. We mentioned that there was alien influence. And we wanted it to be a type of place where it's going to be like what Rapture was to Bioshock. That the environment is powerful to the player to keep them playing along as much of an impact as the story or character development will be. And we have some concepts here that kind of illustrate how it could be built into underground architecture and how you could uh, deal with the caverns and stuff. And the great thing about this is that we're not really limited. Since it is alien technology, you can, you can kind of construct whatever setting you want out of it. And this is a good example of how we have things built into the stalagmites and stalactites of the underground area. But uh, like we have here, you know, being underground, we have a lot of interesting level design opportunities. You can build on the top, you can build on the ground, or you can build in the middle. So it gives us an opportunity to kind of flesh out into areas we wouldn't normally see in game. And one of the important things about this, we've talked about how there is this invasion of reality. There's this perception that you have this real world temple, this city that's inspired by the real world, and then you've got this, this uh, foreign area here. And that mood is really important to the tone of the game that we're trying to convey. We want it to be something that, it's not quite a survival horror Resident Evil type thing, but it's certainly a type of, what was that around the corner? And this is what I really like this picture for. This is concept art uh, done by Scott Pelka. That we have this pathway that's fairly common, but you know, around the corner here we have something that is kind of leading them around. And by creating situations like this, we'd really like to, to draw the player around with uh, the type of set pieces that we have. Now, when we talk a little bit about uh, this notion of uh, foreign invading the real, we can draw upon that for our enemy design or character design. And one of the great things about having this Aztec influence is that we can draw upon it for our characters. Like this is, uh, this is heavily influenced by the type of art or the type of mythological creatures they have. Another concept piece done by uh, Joe Kress here that shows that we can use that. If that's, if that's the route that we would like to go, we can use that to populate our game. This other notion that we have, you can't, have, you can't really have an alien structure without having aliens of some sort. So what we have are these creatures that use existing life as a host, and they pervert it, and they twist it into something that's a little bit more aggressive, a little bit more violent than what you see normally. Like this would be an example of this. Now, we'll talk, talk a little bit about this example here. This is a real world iguana. People have iguanas as pets. They're not normally known for being extremely vicious. But when infected by this alien host, you, know, you can see the talons grow. Uh, the ridges along the back are going to turn into be a little bit more uh, violent. You can use them as a weapon or something like that. But the notion is that these, these aliens are turning these creatures into something that would be. Uh, 
uh, dangerous. Keeping with the common theme here of this reality being invaded by the unknown, that carries over to our character. We talk about the energy source a lot in our little uh, pre-presentation skit, and that energy source is gonna come in contact with the main character. We do, as I mentioned, we try to set up with having these real uh, decisions that they have to make. We wanted to establish that because there's gonna be a point in the game where the player is gonna uh, get this power, and now the decisions that they're making are gonna have a completely different scope. And Tim's actually gonna talk about that a little bit and how it relates to the mechanics. So, so at the core of the game, what we really have is this concept that the decisions you make define who you are. But we also want them to sort of define the game as well. So what we want to do is give the player sort of these tools. So imagine yourself in this 3D third perspective world, and you're able to start manipulating the, your underground, the stone blocks and things like that. Now, early on, you're not going to have these powers yet, but you still have decisions to make. And we felt like moral decisions was an important part of this too. Decisions that don't change the world story, but absolutely change the character story of what's going on. So take, for example, you come into this situation and your friend who was with you in college, he's come underground with you to help, and he gets stuck in one of these Aztec traps, and he's going to die if you don't save him. But Joe, a guy that you met, is yelling, help me, I'm trapped too. Uh, you know, he's got kids. He's the, he's the only one supporting his family. You don't have powers at this point. You've got to make this decision about who do I save? You could try to save them both, which probably won't work, or do you go after your dad? Now, behind the scenes, what we want to do is, with those kinds of decisions you're making, is really what happens is he's got a piece of the story, some information that could lead you down a different path. If you save Joe over here, he could go with you and maybe fight alongside you as you're trying to make it through this. So again, we're not changing the world story, but the local story for the character we are. And we want your decisions to affect that. <clears throat> so at about 20% into the game, what we would like to have is that all of a sudden you start to find that energy source. And by touching that, you get the powers. So some of the powers that we've talked about, we wanted them to be a little bit different than what you see in typical games. Is Think of mass attract. So instead of telekinesis where I just move something, imagine that you've got this power that I could focus on rubble over there, and if its mass is less than mine, I'm like a magnet, and it comes shooting towards me. Now I can't control the momentum or the velocity that it's coming, but it's coming at me, and I could move out of the way and use it maybe as a slingshot or, or hurt somebody and damage it, or it's coming. Mm -hmm. Now, what if we reverse that, and there's a column over there, and I focus on that column, well, mass attract, my mass is less than that. And it would be like a movement mechanism where it would pull me up to that column. A good way to escape enemies, let's say. We've talked about something called like mass transfer. So if there's a, a boulder or a rock here, I could touch that and all of a sudden bring its mass into me, and now I've got this huge sort of, I wouldn't change my form, but I'd be stronger and thicker, maybe could hold a rope of friends that are climbing up on it or something, or take the mass away and lighten the rock, and now I can use that to solve puzzles. You can imagine in this world you've got that going on. One of my favorite powers that we talk about is this concept of sticky light blob, a very fancy name. The idea that you excrete this sort of gelatinous gel that lights. So when we talk about the atmosphere of the game, and the fact that we want shadows and and create sort of this, what's happening next? You've got this light source with you that, that moves and goes along. But what you could also do is throw it against a wall and then create shadows and lighting off of that wall. And, and as this, you use this more, I could use this as, as an attack and throw it into an enemy's eyes and blind them. With all of these powers, when you make the decision to use them more and more, almost think of them as skill trees. They'll evolve, they'll get stronger. So when I've thrown this power the, or this light into somebody, it would maybe start evolving into this sticky substance that could immobilize them. So let me give you an example. I'm Chris, and I come into this huge cavern, and it's clear to me I've got these powers that I need to get to the end over there, because there's a light, that's the end, so that's what I'm trying to do. But those lizard things, or the, the lizard things, the iguana things we saw, they've been perverted by that, that alien, they've been possessed, and now they're hideous dog-like, and they've got me in their sights. I need to get over there. I could start being stealthy, and maybe start evolving those powers because I'm using them more, and start to blend into the environment, or maybe mask myself from their senses. Or maybe I play the game a little bit more aggressively. And what I've decided to do is I'm gonna start running after those beasts and throwing these light blobs, and all of a sudden they start to get encased in these things, and I can get it around. Or the rubble up there, start to attract that so that now it creates an avalanche and covers the beast or the column, pull myself up to it. The point is that I'm getting at is, the world story is not changing. 
but how you come into this environment and how you solve that particular problem is up to you, and your character will change with that. So if there's one thing I guess I want you to remember about Nexus, it's that the decisions matter. They matter with both how you play the game and how Chris evolves itself, but they also matter about the story and the character story. Questions? <laughs>